Hi, random internet person, and welcome to Set Us Up. My name is Ken, and in this series, I want to show you how to build your own network attached storage, including a media center and personal cloud storage. This is the first video in the series, and in this video, I will go over the hardware and software requirements and show you how to install the operating system. Our device will be comprised of a PC with two hard drives, one hard drive holding the OS and the other drive holding storage. So what is Network Attached Storage, or NAS? Really, it's just a specialized computer that is built to serve files. And the ones you can buy nowadays for home use are like this Netgear NAS over here on the right. It's basically just a box with a hard drive in it and a small motherboard with a custom operating system and custom software on it. We can look at some of the devices for 2019 and as you can see, you got Western Digital, Seagate, all kinds of different devices. Some include multiple hard drives with RAID capability, so you have some redundancy. You can get different capacities, two, three, four terabytes. And in this case, you have remote file access, DLNA, which is a media server, and it has an iTunes server. So with all these different options, how much does one cost? Well, I did a Google search on the Western Digital MyCloud Personal, and as we can see here, they cost 160 up to over $200, depending on how many hard drives you have and the capabilities. So what's the advantage of building your own? Well, it's not necessarily going to be cheaper, though I think it is competitive. But the main advantage is that you have as expandable a system as you want. You can add memory to the motherboard, you can add hard drives, and you can also customize the software. You can run anything you can on a Linux system. The most important thing to me is that you know exactly what's on the computer and you know who the computer is communicating with. With these off-the-shelf devices, I have no idea if they're phoning back home and if depending on what kind of files you're storing on this thing, you may not want that to happen. I sure would not want my banking files on one of these servers to somehow make it out into the internet. So, given that, and you want to build your own, what kind of server should you buy? So this is a server I currently use as my NAS. It's a Lenovo Think Center with a Intel i5 chip and four gigabytes of RAM don't really care about the graphics card because I run headless and it comes with an operating system Windows 10 and we're not going to need that because we're going to put our own OS on here so if you're looking for one whether it's this computer or another get it without the operating system it should be a little cheaper and this one uh, sold by Newegg is $129 I know I didn't pay that much when I got mine and then of course this does not come with our storage so how much does storage cost well I did a search on Newegg for a one terabyte serial ATA drive, 50 bucks. You may be able to find it cheaper. Uh, looking at the sizes here, if we went to two terabytes, it's a whopping $61. Anyway, you could, uh, you have options. You can get larger drives or multiple smaller drives and use RAID. It's up to you. The initial build we're going to do, I'm just going to use OneDrive and not do RAID, and I will save that for a later video. So, once you get your hardware together, it'll be time to install the OS and configure the system. So, I think we'll do that now. Okay, the first thing we need to do is download the operating system for our NAS device. And the operating system we will use is CentOS, which is a free version of Red Hat. At the time of this video, we're going to be downloading version 7 of CentOS, and we will choose the minimum ISO, which means that it will be just the operating system with no extra software. The link to the download page is posted below, and I will be using my Windows 10 machine to download the ISO. So we're going to go to the download link.
And as you can see, we have an option of downloading a full DVD ISO or a minimal ISO. And we'll choose the minimal. And then we can choose from a mirror in the region. And I'm not sure which one is the fastest, so I'm just going to pick the first one. And we're downloading. And now we will turn on our time machine and get this download done quick. Okay, looks like we're done. Now we need to burn this ISO to our USB stick and we need to make that USB stick bootable for our NAS device. And there's plenty of utilities out there that will do this, but the one I use and like is called Rufus. So we're going to go download that from the Rufus website, rufus.ie. And here's the Rufus website. We go down to the download link and we will get the program. It's very small, so it should not take very long. So let's open our downloads folder. And we have Rufus and we have the ISO. So let's run Rufus. And it sees our eight gigabyte USB stick. And we need to select the ISO we want to burn. And we'll choose this. And we can take the defaults for everything else. We'll just hit start. And this ISO hybrid image, we'll just take the recommended setting. We're now being warned that the stick will be destroyed. We'll click OK. And we're off. And I will use the time machine once again to get to the end of this. And we are done. We should now have a USB stick with CentOS install package on it that is bootable. So let's check it out. There we go. And as you can see, all the files are there. So we're going to uh, eject our USB. And we'll switch over to our NAS device and boot it up. OK. We have booted up our NAS off our USB stick, and we're at the CentOS install. We have some options here. We can, of course, install the OS. We can test the media, and we can do troubleshooting. In this case, we're just going to do the install. Okay, the graphical installer will start here in a second. And here we are. So now we need to choose the language. We're going to go with English. It's the one I know the best. And now we have several things we need to set up before we can do the actual install. The first thing I like to set up is the network. As you can see, it is not connected. So we will click on this, and we go to the network screen. You can see that our network is actually turned off. So we will turn it on. And we grab an IP address from the router. Now for our server, we don't want to use DHCP. We want to assign a static IP address. So we want to click Configure. And we're going to go to the IPv4 settings. And as you can see, it's currently set for DHCP. We're going to change this to manual. And we're going to add our IP address in it. Now, the network that I'm on is a 192.168.1 network. So we're going to choose a 1.200, which is outside the DHCP scope. And so no other computer will autom be automatically assigned this IP. Our net mass will be 24, which is the 255.255.255.0 net mask. So we'll take that, and our gateway will be the router, which is 192.168.1.1. Now we'll go down to DNS servers, and we'll use our router again for the DNS servers. And our search domain, which is optional, but in my case, I'm going to put in my domain, which is setusup.info. Uh, everything looks good, so we'll click Save here. And we will click, oh, we've got to set the host name. I almost forgot about that. Well, local host is probably not a good one, so you can choose a 
name and I want to choose NAS. Hit apply. Okay, now we're set up. We can click done and we show that we're connected. Now the next thing I'd like to set up is the date and time. As you can see, it's currently set to the New York time zone, Eastern. I'm not Eastern, I'm Central, so I want to change that. So let's go in. I want to click in the Eastern time zone. It clicks. The click takes me to Chicago. That's fine. And everything looks okay. Network type is on, so that means we will eventually sync up with an atomic time server, atomic clock. So we'll hit done. Keyboard is English, language is English, installation source is local. We got the minimum install. So now finally we need to set our installation destination. And we'll click here. We see our two hard drives. We got the 128 gigabyte for the OS and the, ten, uh, the one terabyte for the storage. So we're going to select both these hard drives and then we're going to manually partition them. So we'll select I will configure partitioning. We click done and we will be taken to the manual partition. Now in this case I'm going to create some mount points. And for those of you who are not familiar with Linux, mount points are basically folders pointed to hard drives. And in Linux, you have to set up at least three mount points. The first one is called a boot mount point, which is where the kernel images are stored. Uh, the second one is a swap file, which is used for virtual memory. And then the third mount point is your root mount point that is the beginning of your file system, where the OS is installed and your applications can be installed. In our case, we're going to have those three mount points plus a fourth mount point, which will point, a, point to the one terabyte drive. So anyway, the first mount point we're going to create is a, a standard partition mount point. We'll hit plus, and we're going to select the boot. And for boot, we, we're going to configure a one gigabyte capacity, and we add it in. There we go. And as you can see, the boot is on the SDA1, which... SDA is the 128 gigabyte drive we're going to use for OS. SDB is our one terabyte. So SDA1 this is the first mount point on the SDA drive. Now let's uh, add another mount point. We're going to choose the swap. And I'm going to give it a four gigabyte swap file. There we go. And then our last mount point is going to be the root, which is just a slash. And in this case, we're going to give it a, for right now, I'm going to say it's 124 gigabytes. And when I mean right now, I mean that right now it is thinking that it has access to the SDA and, as you can see, one other, which is the terabyte drive. I'm not going to put the root on my terabyte drive. So I'm going to give it something less so it will kind of fit in here and then we will modify from there. You'll see what I mean here in a second. So now for these three mount points, I want to make sure that it only uses the SDA drive. So I'm going to modify each one and select just the SDA drive. Okay, good. Now we want to set up the mount point for our NAS. So we are going to switch to, actually, we're just going to add the mount and I'm going to call it NAS. And my desired capacity is going to be one terabyte. Now, it didn't give us quite one terabyte, but we're going to fix that in a second. And we notice that our device type is standard partition, but in this case, we're going to switch to LVM. And what this will give us is the ability to easily add drives in, set up a RAID, that kind of thing. So, when I selected LVM, it automatically created a volume group. And I don't like that name, so we're going to click Modify. 
And as you can see, it actually added both of the drives into the volume group. We don't want that. We just want our terabyte drive. And I want to change the name just to NAS. Uh, we could specify a RAID level. And we could do encryption here. We're not going to do that at this time. I'm going to make a future video where I do set this up. Anyway, everything looks good here. We'll hit save. So now we've got the NAS volume group with the NAS mount attached to it. We've got our boot, our root, and our swap all connected to the SDA drive. Now if we look, we see we have 100 gigabytes of available space from both drives. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to go up to the NAS and I want to tell the desired capacity I want to use every single bit of this uh, drive. So I'm going to give it something way beyond the capacity, two terabytes. I'll click out and that should allocate everything. And as you can see that went up to 1023.99. As we all know, a terabyte is 1024 gigabytes. So we've pretty much got everything now. Now down here, we still have eight gigabytes free and that's on our SDA drive, the 128 gigabyte drive. I've got my boot set up, I've got the swap set up, so I want to give everything else to my root. And so what I'm going to do here is, again, give it something that is beyond, like, say, 200 gigabytes. I'll click out, and as you can see, it gave almost everything else to us. We have, looks like a megabyte left. That's fine, it's only a megabyte. I'm not going to lose sleep over it. Anyway, everything looks set up. The NAS is on the uh, NAS volume group, one terabyte. Everything else is set up. We'll click Done. And we get a summary of changes. You can see what it's doing here. We're going to be formatting both drives, creating partition tables, creating the LVM, formatting everything with XFS. Now, you could go back and choose EXT4, EXT3, you know, whatever format you want to use. I'll stick with S XFS. And there's a swap file, boot, mount, everything's good. We're going to accept the changes. And at this point, we are ready to begin. There's no security policy that we're going to be using here. And there's nothing else to set, so we'll click on Begin. Now it is actually installing, and we can do a couple things while it's doing that. One, we're going to set the root password. Now, of course, this is a very important password, and you need to make it as strong as possible. I'm going to put in a password, which will work for me for this demonstration. It says it's good and not strong. That's fine. Click Done. And we're going to create a user. And I'm going to create the user as me. And I'm going to make myself an administrator, which means that I get to run applications as the root using the sudo command, which we will be using a lot coming up. And we need to give ourselves a pretty good password, so I'm going to get myself a good password. And please make it a different password than the root password. Okay, we're good. We don't have to worry about advanced. We'll click Done. And that's everything we need to do. We just need to wait for the installation to finish. So I will turn on the time warp here, and we'll go to the end. And we're done. Our install is complete. So let's go ahead and click Reboot and make sure everything comes back up. And it has rebooted. We've got our login screen. And I didn't see any errors. So I think we're good. Not too bad, huh? So in the next video, I want to show you how to get the system configured a little bit better, uh, install patches, and set up a Windows share so our Windows computer can access it. If you like what you saw and want to see more, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell to get notified of more videos. Please post any questions or comments below. Check out our Twitter account, at SetUsUpChannel. Thanks for taking the time for watching, and I'll see you later.